Welcome everyone to the HAI Weekly Research Seminar. I'm Vanessa Parley, and I am the Interim Director of Research Programs at HAI. I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Mohsen Bayati. Mohsen received his PhD from Stanford in electrical engineering and spent two years as a postdoctoral researcher with Microsoft, working on applications of machine learning and optimization in healthcare and online advertising. He's also a postdoc, or he was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University with a focus on high dimensional statistical learning and is now an associate professor of operations information and technology at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. In his talk today, Mawson will discuss a recent body of research suggesting that algorithms for stochastic multi-armed bandit problems that focus solely on exploitation, also known as greedy algorithms, can perform quite well compared to classical multi-armed bandits. He will highlight the emergence of this phenomenon and suggest directions for future investigation. Before we begin the presentation, a few logistics. We can use the Zoom chat to chat within this group, but please use the QR code on the screen to ask questions through Slido, or you can click the link that will be in the chat shortly. I'll be choosing questions from Slido after the presentation, and Slido has that nice upvote feature, so I can choose questions that are of most interest to all of you. Mohsen, thank you so much again for joining us. Feel free to share your screen and begin. Thank you, Vanessa, for the very kind introduction. Okay, so, and thank you all for joining this webinar. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this project that is joint work with a colleague of mine, Professor Ramesh Johari, uh, and two very good PhD students that uh, recently graduated, Nima Hamidi and Hasher Husravi. Um, in fact, Ramesh and I were supposed to give this presentation together, but a few days ago, he had a small family issue and he couldn't make it. So let me start by uh, motivating this project. So consider a hospital that wants to reduce post-hospitalization complications. And in, specifically, they want to increase uh, the support they provide to their patients after they leave the hospital. And let's say they have, uh, they have been reviewing different options and there are two telehealth solutions, A and B, that they can test for every patient. And they wanna find out which one of these two are more effective to reduce post-discharge complications. The gold standard approach to do something like this, to test which one of the two is uh, better, is what's known as a randomized con control trial or an RCT, and uh, also an A-B test, which is you say, I have 200 patients, and you, you decide you want to test to figure out which one of A and B is better. You select 200 patients, and then half of these patients are randomly allocated to uh, group A, receive this, uh, like we make this decision for them. And then for the other 100 patients, we make this decision. And then after this random allocation, you look at the results and you see which one of them is uh, most effective. However, in healthcare setting, uh, these type of experiments or RCTs are quite expensive. You need large teams of co to coordinate many processes to take patient consent, to educate them. And uh, it's quite delicate and normally very expensive. And in a lot of situations, you won't even be able to get approval to do this type of uh, experiments. Uh, there are some cases even considered unethical to run experiments. So, uh, there is this lingering challenge that uh, if in order to learn, you know, we have to, like we want to learn which one of A and B, which one of these two decisions. And the only way we can learn is by trying them. But at the same time, we have this cost of, or opportunity cost of running the experiment that stays with us. So that's just one motivating example. Now let's move to the 
online world, companies these days run tens of thousands of these experiments uh, to find out, for example, uh, when they want to recommend product to their users, uh, and there is a large set of new products or new sellers in their platforms, and they want to test which seller is better or which product is better, they really need to run these type of experiments to try out the better content at the same time, like configurations to the website, like should it have a, say, a red font or green font or certain areas, all those things are going through tests. Uh, which are experiments like what we discussed, but even in an uh, in a setting like theirs, that we may not have those unethical issues at this on the surface, uh, or we may not have a large cost because, as you see, all these experiments are being run at scale. Even in those situations, there is still concern about the opportunity cost of the experiment because I will actually show you in a few slides that there is a there is financial cost around these experiments because the users by testing out new things for the platform they are potentially getting an inferior experience and this could impact their engagement this could impact their uh, potentially even the direct uh, revenue achieved through the advertising channels etc and sometimes you end up having a PR problem. Like a few years ago, Facebook uh, had this, uh, ex they ran this experiment to uh, up with, on the news feed of the users and it was uh, basically a big PR issue for Facebook. So these experiments are not really free and there is an opportunity cost. And in fact, let's just look at a spectrum and uh, Imagine in one end of the spectrum, the cost of experimentation is low. This is like say in an online world or in a setting that you don't mind to run these experiments versus the setting like a healthcare case where the cost of experimentation is very high. So RCTs or we call these pure exploration uh, policies and throughout this talk, I will actually more use exploration, but it basically is the same as trying things out, trying new things. That's what it refers to. So our cities are on this end of the spectrum. And then what we call as greedy policies or pure exploitation uh, are on this other end. And the way I want you to think about them is imagine you have a set of decisions like those treatments that we talked about in the first slide. And maybe you have tried them a little bit, but not sufficiently. Like you don't know, you don't know yet how good they are. You have, but you have tried them a little bit, maybe like for 10 patients, you have tried them. So you have data from those 10 patients. And from that, you can check so far, which one was the best. So that's what a greedy policy does. It always decides Instead of saying, Yo, look, I haven't still tried a, maybe a third option. Maybe I should try a third option. Or no, I have tried these two options and one of them was work was better. So should I go with the one of them was better, which is a greedy option versus try a third option, which is we call an exploration. So that's the two end of the spectrum. spectrum. And uh, indeed, because of these costs that we talked about, uh, in many years ago, like this really the early research to this in the research community, not in practice, goes back to 30s and uh, also in 80s that this concept of multi arm banded experiments have been introduced as a way of not doing pure exploration and not, of course, doing pure exploitation because we still want to learn and learning can only happen by trying new things. So they're kind of sitting in the middle to balance these uh, two trade-offs. And in fact, over the last 10 years, or maybe a little more, it's actually made its way to practice. Like the literature, the research literature, mathematical literature is vast. It's been going on since like 80s or before, but the practical uh, applications of them really became popular recently. Uh, and uh, for example, Google Analytics, 
uh, has a page that explains multi-arm bandit experiments to advertisers and that's actually I encourage like that's a good read because it, it's re written really without all those math jargon so one can understand uh, without needing to look at the formula and uh, so in the online world, it's becoming more and more popular. Basically, let me just give you numbers so you see why it's becoming popular. So this is coming from the Google Analytics uh, website. Uh, they are saying, imagine you have two websites A and B, and they have conversion rates. So for an advertiser, like they have two com or two websites or two, even you can think of two ads. They have conversion rates four percent and five percent, but we don't we don't know that in advance. We want to test them out to figure that out. You can use some statistical calculations and uh, realize if you want to run a pure exploration, like an A-B test policy, uh, which randomly allocates some users to A, some users to B, needs about 20,000, 22,000 roughly observations, which means like for 22,330 users, we have to randomly allocate them to A and B, in order to have enough data so we learn the conversion rates of A and B and we know which one of them is the better one in this case B. But the same Google Analytics website shows that if you run this equivalent multi-arm bandit experiment version you actually need 80% roughly less samples like 4,800 and if you look at the fact that we have tried a lot less samples, that means we have, just, just think about it, anytime we allocate a sample to this, this version, we are losing that 1% conversion rate. So imagine all the traffic that was going to this one multiply by that 1% gap. So we would have been losing about 97.5 conversions. So the multi-arm bandit experiment saves this much conversion and it still is able to tell us that B is the best configuration out of the two. So it's almost like we get something for free. Of course, there is always some trade-off in fact that what it, in fact, let me explain to you how it does this. Like what's, is it like magic? But the way it works is instead of allocating, like make a decision right off the bat that I'm gonna put 50% of the traffic to A, 50% to B, it says, I'm gonna do that, but not for everything. Like I may maybe do that for the first 500 users to my website, or maybe for the first, first 100 users to my website, I allocate them 50-50 to A and B. And that means I have partial data and I can now look at the performance of those conversion rate for those users. It's not enough to give me a statistically significant difference between A and B, but it's enough to tell me that it looks like potentially with a very good high probability, you can show that, it's enough to show us that B seems to be doing better so far. And we can look at this result and because B seems to be doing better, that means that the, the, the experiment starts allocating more traffic to B. That, so instead of 50-50, maybe after the first 500 users, it starts using 60-40 towards A and B, uh, more towards B. And then maybe after another 500, it puts 70, 30. So it doesn't fully give up on A, but gives more traffic to B. And that's how it is able to achieve this smaller number of total samples because it starts learning about B much faster than the RCT approach. So that's really how it works. So that's this example kind of highlights like why it's becoming so popular in the online world, uh, in e-commerce uh, specifically. Now let's go back to this slide. So the thing is, even though we are able to save ex those conversions or we are able to reduce the cost, it, we, didn't, we don't narrow it down to zero, meaning we are still trying new things. And in fact, you will see when I formally show you one of these examples, uh, that how it is trying new, new decisions. Uh, so it, which means we are deviating for some of our users or in a healthcare setting, we are deviating potentially from some of, for some of our patients from the greedy decision, which is the best decision for that user given the data up to that point. 
And it's unsatisfying the fact that we are deviating from the greedy decision for that, say, patient in the healthcare setting and in the online setting, potentially the fact that it's going to have a cost, like there is this cost of exploring. So then the question is, can we do better? And in fact, specifically, can we only use these policies? Like, do these policies even work? Now, of course, there's a lot of literature that shows these policies, these greedy policies don't work. They actually are bad. And we will show you what is their biggest weakness, but intuitively, their biggest weakness is they may just fixate on a decision early on in the experiment. Like maybe for the first 500 users to the website, like one of the configurations, like by chance, was really good and it was the wrong configuration. And then it, inf then it actually gets all the traffic to it. And then we're not going to try the other configuration as enough to be able to correct our mistake. So that's how these greedy policies are generally known, at least in the literature, not perform well. But recently, there's been some interesting results that show these greedy policies actually do work well. So let me actually show you two sets that, in fact, I put this, there's a lot of papers, but I'm going to highlight a few that are related to my work and Professor Johari's work, because that's how we actually ended up working together and um, receiving support from a, a Stanford High to work on this project that you will be hearing the rest of today. So, in one set of uh, cases uh, in Professor Johari's work, the reason greedy policies they show work is that you have, say, access to a set of decisions and you want to try them out. And then the greedy policy just tries what's best so far. But what happens is because of some constraints, one of like that greedy decision is not even available to you. Like imagine that like uh, it's an ad that you're only allowed to show for, like 50 times a day and you just run out of it. So you have to try something else. So because of these constraints of the problem, you end up trying different things. And they show that in this situation, when you follow a greedy policy, <laughs> then you end up actually still learning because of the structure in the system, you end up switching, trying different decisions. Another, uh, so this goes back to my own project with uh, Hamza Bastani and Hashar Khosravi, and also there is uh, several other papers in this uh, topic. You learn because of the personalization, and the way you want to think about it is, just think of uh, I have two decisions, and it's not the case that A is always worse than B. It, there's a personalization component, meaning for some users or patients, A is better, and for some patients, B is better. Now, because the patients that arrive to the system are different, they, are, they have a heterogeneous uh, attributes, then we just, be, even if we want to try a greedy policy, we will be switching from A to B because of the fact that new patients are just different. So there is a diverse, as long as there's a diverse set of patients, the policy, the greedy policy learn on its own. So because of these two, we were interested to understand of what else or under what other circumstances greedy policies work. Uh, so that's how we were motivated. So, so far it was all just all motivation, but now let's try to get to the uh, problem, set of problems that we studied. And in fact, we, we started looking at a set of problems where the experimentation cost is very big. And these are family of problems, which we call many decision problems or large decision problems. Let me give you three examples. So let's say Netflix wants to recommend content to its users. There's a vast set of options they have when they want to select and especially think of new content, the content that has not been even tested much. So really need to test them. So that's an example that you have many decisions. Another example is a mobile health application uh, that is trying to engage users in healthy activities by sending them, say, messages. 
like by sending the right message at the right time. Uh, and so the decision could be a combination of message and time and even other circumstances, then uh, they will be able to nudge the user to engage in healthy activity. There is great work being done by Susan Murphy's team in Harvard uh, on this topic. So I'm actually taking this picture from there, uh, their paper. So there is, uh, and in fact, they use multi many experiments to, for something like this. Now, one thing, so, so in a situation like this, you have potentially many different actions, the combinations of imagine uh, messages and then the circumstances around the messages. Another example is combination chemotherapy. You have say, like for cancer, uh, you have four, five, or maybe six base drugs. And then you're trying to figure out what's the right combination of these drugs that can achieve the best efficacy and least uh, toxicity and optimizes a trade-off. So all these combinations can actually create a large set of decisions potentially. So that's another set of examples that involve many decisions. Now, one thing I want you to think about is why cost of experimentation in these settings is large because imagine we said, uh, like in the cases of two decisions, it, just to have enough data or at least like little data just to learn a little bit about them, you just need maybe try the two decisions once or twice and you didn't really make uh, the opportunity cost is just those two, three decisions that we may have made the wrong decision because we were trying things out. But now here, imagine I have, I don't know, thousands of decisions to make. Now, if I want to try all of these thousands, just at least once, that's already a huge opportunity cost. So the number of decisions when it's large, clearly just by even trying them once, we are incurring a huge cost. So that's why we thought, uh, let's look at this family of problems that already involve a huge opportunity cost because of this sheer volume of the decisions. Now, one thing I want to mention is the three examples that I showed you, all of them, the decisions, in fact, better be personalized. What I mean, like, look at the Netflix content example. It's quite clear that some users like diff one type of content and another type of users like different type of content, or in the case of like health messages or treatments, like treatments need to be personalized. Now, we actually started looking at that problem and we realized the personalized version of the problem was quite difficult. So we, we started looking at a simpler setting, which is a standard in the multi unbanded literature, which is this for now, assume the decisions are not personalized. And then for the next 10, 20 minutes, I will continue in that setting. And then later I'll go back at the personalization. Uh, and just saying upfront, like our theoretical models are for the non-personalized setting, but we do have evidence that everything we, we can understand mathematically in the non-personalized setting applies to the personalized setting as well through simulations that I will show you. So what's the model? Like what's the simple mathematical model? In fact, there is, I, I'm trying to avoid uh, putting a uh, math jargon uh, all over the place. So I'm going to highlight in orange the key, uh, there are only two, three key variables that I'm going to need throughout this presentation. So I'm highlighting them in orange. So imagine I have K decisions. So K is always the number of decisions in the case of health. And actually from now on, you want to maybe think about the case of health app messages. So I have say K messages that I want to send to users to nudge them in healthy activity. Now reward, so the notion of reward is like, in the case of like that 4%, 5% we saw before was the reward really. Uh, so reward of a decision in the case of messages, imagine if a message causes a user to go and out and run uh, for like 20% of the time that you show the message. So we say the reward of that message is 20% versus another message may have a reward of 5%. For only 5% of the time, it causes a user go out and uh, run or do like certain healthy activity that you have in mind. 
Now I have K is a large set of decisions or messages. And each one of them has this unknown. So the 20% or 5% like are denoted by these mu i. So that's unknown to me. And I will not be using these throughout the rest of the talk. So I'm only introducing them in this slide to define the notion of opportunity cost. Now I'm assuming I'm making capital T decisions. So this is like I have capital T patients. Uh, let's say capital T, I don't know, is 10,000 patients in the, like uh, for my uh, health application. And at any time, to, so now let's say I have a policy, like I have decided here is how I'm going to allocate these decisions based off of my data up to so far. Uh, and I call that, denote that policy by pi and the decision that that policy makes at that time t is pi of t so if my if i have say 100 decisions and then at time 20 my policy makes the first decision the pi 20 will be one so that's how uh, this notation is used now i have everything to define my notion of opportunity cost, or in fact, quote unquote, regret that I will use throughout the rest of the talk. So let's understand for every single patient. So there are capital T patients for every single patient at, like let's say little t goes from one to capital T. I am going to uh, make a decision pi T and the reward I'm gonna get is mu of pi T. Right, so that's the reward that I'm gonna get in expectation for that patient. But if I had taken the best decision, I would have had the maximum of all these mu's. So for every single patient, I'm losing out the difference between these two. And now I add up for all of the patients through the horizon. And there's an expectation because there is randomness in this problem or uncertainty. And just to show you there are actually several sources of randomness that is good to highlight. One is that all these mu's themselves are random from a common prior distribution. The policy itself, maybe like if, if my policies was at RCT, that means it would have randomized. For every single patient, it would just pick one of these at random. So the policy makes randomization of its own. That's why we have like the so expectation is also with respect to that randomness. And the third source of randomness is the fact that even if my say my decision is 20% successful, that doesn't mean every time is 20, like it's actually either gonna be successful or not, right? So there is a noise there and on average it is 20% successful. So that's the three sources of randomness. Now, now that I given you all the building blocks, in fact, throughout the rest, I'm just gonna use K and T, that's all. And, the regret. So, and just if you don't like the formula or anything, just think of I have k decisions. I have I'm trying to make these k decisions ten times, t times, and this is my opportunity cost. How much I'm losing out by trying trying a decision that may not be the best decision. Okay. So, using this model, we can actually show every policy you try, even like the best policy that you can think of uses the most advanced machine learning or AI cannot do better than, cannot have a regret or opportunity cost that is better than minimum of these two numbers. And the point that I want to highlight is like we say uh, uh, grows at least by this. So that means it's a, like the opportunity cost is like a constant, like maybe, 10 times say this number. It's a constant multiplied by this. So I'm growing K or K and T and my opportunity cost grows as a constant times this term. And let's just look at it very quickly. So that means there are two regimes actually. In one regime, the number of decisions is less than a square root of the number of times I'm making decision or my number of patients. Another regime is the number of decisions is more than a square root t. Now, this one is relatively straightforward why we see this, because uh, as we said, we have to try every decision at least once, right? So 
if I have to try every decision at least once, then I'm going to actually incur at least a loss k times, or in a way, k minus one times. But it scales the same as k. But this one is interesting. It's actually telling us that, so by the way, this is a lower bound. Like we are not saying we can actually achieve this. All we are saying is that our opportunity cost is at least this much. It could be more. We have to demonstrate that we can actually achieve something like this, which is gonna be our next uh, result. But one thing by just looking at the difference between these two is that subsampling is a critical step when k is bigger than a square root t, or when you have, so what does subsampling mean? I will formally say in the next few slides, but shortly means uh, we are, uh, if I have a lot of, let's say I have a thousand decisions, then I should not try them all. I should take a subset of them at random or according to some considerations, then only try that subset. So that's interesting. It's like we are right off the bat are gonna give up on certain decisions, a subset of decisions. And it's kind of feels risky, but we can actually show that we're not gonna lose because they have been in a world that you have too many decisions, you have actually too many good decisions as well. So that's really the key intuition. In fact, let me introduce this subsample UCB policy. So subsample UCB policy is, uh, in fact, SS refers to subsampled and UCB refers to upper confidence bound, which I'm gonna mention in a second. Basically it says subsample, like for like just to simplify your life, just assume K is bigger than root T. So that means I'm uh, sampling root T decisions uniformly at random. Like if I have, like I sub take, root t of my health messages at random completely, and then execute the following policy among the subsample set. First, try every single one of them once. Then in the remaining time periods, so this is what I end up doing. Like by trying every single decision once in the subsample set, so let's say I have only five in the subsample set. So every one of these is one decision. Then I can actually predict the reward based on the data I've collected so far, based off the number of times I've tried them so far. And I can get a, so this is my best prediction for their, uh, the center of these intervals is my best prediction for the reward of each one of these actions. And there's a confidence interval because if I actually try an action only once, this confidence interval will be huge. So, uh, now, looking at these confidence intervals, this upper confidence bound algorithm picks the one that has highest upper end. And the main intuition behind this is if I have enough data, these confidence intervals shrink, so upper and center will be the same. So I'm actually ending up picking the one that has highest center. And if I don't have enough data, on an action, if an action is not tried, then I have so much uncertainty. So by picking that upper end, even if I made a wrong action, I actually reduce its uncertainty. So the next round, it was gonna go down and it will not be selected. So that's the intuition behind this policy. Now, our second result says, this SSUCB policy actually gives you that optimal uh, that we talked about before. So we said no policy can do better than minimum of these two. And again, just for simplicity, imagine you are in this regime. We are saying no policy can do better than a square root T. And we are saying this subsample UCB can actually achieve an opportunity cost that be less at the most. So this one is at least, this one is at most that is square root of T. And in fact, the theory of multi arm bandit like the whole literature on multi arm bandits, if you look up, it's filled by results like this, that you have this kind of a scale, uh, or they call this asymptotic regret. And in fact, when, whenever an algorithm like SSUCB gives you such a performance, they're saying the algorithm is code and code rate optimal. And a lot of times we say, okay, we are satisfied, like in the mathematical world, but you know, you won't be satisfied by just seeing these as a practitioner. You will say, I wanna see how it works. 
Before I show you how it works, I run a simulation. I'm going to formally tell you a couple of other option policies other than SSUCB. So one is greedy. I already told you what it was. Basically, at any time, I have these centers as my best, as my prediction of the reward of these five actions. And greedy picks the action that has the highest center. It says, I don't care about the uncertainty. I don't, I'm not trying to explore for the patient. I'm trying to make the best decision for this patient based on the data up, I have up to this one. And in this case, this one has the highest center. So that's what the greedy policy does. And in fact, looking at this spectrum, uh, notice that, so greedy is in this end because it does not explore at all. But let's try to see how come this UCB is exploring. Imagine you are at the beginning, you have tried on each action only once or maybe twice, then you have very large confidence intervals. So if I have very large confidence intervals, my decision-making is as good as random. It's like I'm picking one of these at random. Picking one of these at random is very close to the RCT, in fact. So that's why UCB is exploring a lot when these intervals are big. And as we call it, it collects more and more data intervals shrink, it explores less. So that's why UCB is here and greedy is here. And RCT would be here because it always just randomizes. It doesn't care about these estimates at all. So I introduced UCB for you. I introduced greedy. Now let me introduce Thomson sampling, which is another algorithm. And this one, so UCB decided based out of this top point, greedy decides based out of based off of the center point. Thompson sampling says, no, I'm gonna take a random point in the interval. And the randomization is based off of a distribution in that interval of my predicted reward distribution based off of data I've seen so far. Uh, it's formally known as the posterior distribution. Again, putting the jargon aside, think of it that Thompson sampling picks a random green points from every interval, but the probability of picking closer to center is higher because of the fact that center, it has the bigger, more mass in that distribution, if you notice. And then picks the decision with the highest value of the green point. In this case, it would be this one. So that's Thomson sampling. This is uh, a third policy. Now I'm gonna compare the three of these guys. And I'm showing you two scenarios. Uh, let's just for now look at the scenario on the left. And I also have each algorithm like greedy, UCB and Thomson sampling, I have the subsampled version of them as well. So it, basically the algorithms are paired. So I have two versions of UCB. It's the orange is the normal UCB that does not subsample, just tries all the actions first once and then runs UCB. And then the SSUCB, the one that we actually theoretically said is quote unquote rate optimal. Then we have two versions of Thompson sampling and two versions of greedy. So the very first thing is our first insight is actually validated, which is subsampling is critical for every single algorithm. By the way, this is like just another algorithm known in the literature, we can ignore it. It's like the red one, you can ignore this UCBF. It's actually not a great algorithm as well. So it, we don't, there's no harm in ignoring it. So the first point is subsampling helps for every single algorithm you see here. The subsampled version improves upon the non subsample version. So we did not lose by ignoring a large set of our decisions. We only picked a square root T of our decisions. In, in fact, we are in the regime that K is bigger than the square root T. A square root of 20,000 is uh, much smaller than 1,000 actually, it's about 140. So uh, that means we are subsampling a square root or like say 140 decisions out of those thousand decisions at random. And we are not losing, we are actually ending up doing better. So that's important. So it validates our first insight, but the unsatisfying part of our result is that this subsample UCB that was quote unquote rate optimal is actually worse than even the non-subsampled version of Thompson sampling or greedy. 
And the same holds even in another regime. Okay, in this other regime where K is bigger, the subsample version of UCB is better than Thomson, but still compared to the subsample version of Thomson or UCB, it's not doing well. Sorry, our greedy is not doing well. And in fact, if you had run this simulation for a small K, very small K, like say two or three, like classical A-B testing, greedy would have been really bad. And that's why like in the literature, generally greedy policies are known to be not reliable. But suddenly we are seeing in this large K many or uh, many K decisions, many decisions, problems, greedy is actually working well. And our theory so far does not say anything about that. So we, in fact, that led us, like uh, I would say, all the results up to this point, we achieved maybe in the first 20% of our research journey. And then the remaining 80% was really trying to understand how the greedy policy actually performs and can we formalize this. So the very first thing we could show was the following. Okay, so remember this was the lower bound. We were able to show that now I'm actually taking a specific reward distribution. In this case, I'm calling it Bernoulli. So it's like there's a success, yes or no. It's like click, for example, on an ad, or is this uh, treatment successful or not? So like, a, or if, is the health message gonna make the patient go and do the activity or not? So for these kind of what we call Bernoulli rewards, zero one rewards, we actually show that regret of greedy scales at most by this number. And if you immediately look at this number, you see that if K is bigger than root T, this is a smaller, so this dominates. Now, this already tells you that, you know, if I combine this with subsampling, so if I take a square root T arms at random, then my K becomes a square root T in this, and these two become equal. So I'm actually going to achieve a square root T, which is the same as what my lower bound gives me. So my greedy algorithm, SS greedy algorithm, <laughs> will be quote unquote optimal. And that's very interesting. Not, I'm not fully answering all the observations we saw before. We only only saying that, okay, greedy is not terrible. Uh, and SS greedy, at least in paper, theoretically sh should be as good as SS UCB. So that's all this theory gives us. Now, let's see what else this theory like, can give us. And actually, why is that the case? Like, you know, just showing you the result, it may not be satisfying to tell you actually how come it ended up happening to be the case. And in fact, this goes to the fundamental problem with greedy that I kind of from high level explained before. Greedy's biggest weakness is curse of underestimation. Let me just. Basically, it means if greedy makes a mistake due to underestimation, it cannot redeem itself. Going back to this figure, imagine the black circles are the true average that is unknown to us. And all these intervals are just confidence intervals. So for this action, this is actually the best action, right? Because it has the highest true reward. For some reason, our estimate is really bad. Like we are underestimating it substantially. Because we are underestimating it substantially, <laughs> we end up as a greedy policy trying say this action, even this action has a higher center. So we end up not going back and trying this one. And we, we, in fact, we're gonna keep trying this one. Agree, the greedy policy be, will be stuck with trying this one because the interval is actually pretty small. And that means the interval for this one will never be corrected. The estimate, the bad estimate will never be corrected. So greedy does not get a, ch does not get a chance to redeem itself uh, from this decision. That's really the curse of underestimation that greedy algorithm suffers from and why uh, is in a way like it did not give enough tries to this potentially best decision. <laughs> 
that's really its weakness. But what happens in the many arm problems, oh, by the way, why is overestimation not a problem? It turns out in this problem is overestimation is not a major issue because when you overestimate, like let's say I overestimate, like in, in, in fact, we have, this is an example of an overestimation or this is an example of an overestimation. So if you overestimate, and by mistake, you end up picking that arm because now you're, I, I'm, I have a higher estimation. So I end up going, I'm not gonna like the previous underestimation case, not go back. Underestimation causes us not try the arm, the, the decision. But overestimation will actually make you go and try that decision because you think it's good. But then by trying it, we get more data and we correct our overestimation. So overestimation is never a problem. It's really the underestimation that is a problem. So now in the world with many arms, like this is what we call the blessing of many decisions. I keep using the word arm, arm and decisions refer to the same thing. So in the world of many decisions, this is really the key uh, really result that we were able to prove. And this was a relatively a complex result to prove. Even though reading it is like intuitively makes sense. We are saying when there are many decisions, there is at least one decision that is really good. Maybe it's not the best, but it's very close to the best. And we do not underestimate for it. So that's really the key element that made everything work. So if I wanted like, again, go back to the case of health messages, uh, by combining everything together, we are saying, first of all, if you subsample, like if you have a thousand messages, just take a subsample of them, maybe like 30, 40 of them at random. And the idea is there are there is at least one good decision in that 40. That's why it's not a bad idea to subsample. The second thing is now in that set, there is at least one decision for which we're not gonna underestimate. And it is very good if we follow a greedy policy. So in a way we are saying with many decisions, exploration is not necessary. That's really the key insight for practitioners. The main mathematical tool that allows us to prove this, in fact, is a, is a well-known inequality in ruin theory from the field of finance, which I will not get into, but it basically allows you to say, you know, if you have uh, like a random variables, independent samples of, of a random variable, what is the probability that it's gonna fall below a number that is less than the average? And you can actually prove a bound that say this is, I mean, this inequality puts a bound on this event. So I will not get into it, but I just wanna highlight like there was a tool from ruin theory that allowed us to prove this result. Now, remember I said, we are not yet saying uh, like, okay, so this is the insight, but in fact, this is justifying why greed is well. <laughs> And let me actually show you another curve. So this curve is showing to us. So basically, these are all the decisions. So the, the top 10% decisions, like the 10%, top 10 to top 20% decisions and so forth. And then these are fraction of times, and I'm just do, doing a logarithmic plot so because it's more meaningful. Uh, the fraction of times that each one of the algorithms tries them. So just look at this blue curve, which is this SS greedy, this one. Actually, we are looking at this simulation. So this one, this policy, most of the time is trying these best decisions or one of these best decisions. And it does not experiment with these inferior decisions as much versus if you're looking at all the other policies, they are experimenting still. They're trying out their exploration, trying out all these potentially inferior decisions. And that's where they are losing. So this phenomena that we are observing is in fact aligned with this theoretical result. So this was interesting at least for us, satisfying that we were able to prove something mathematically that explains 
this good performance of greedy. Now, the result was only for Bernoulli, but in fact, we have more generalization for different distributions, which I'm not going to get into. We are uh, towards the end, so I'm just going to end in a minute. Just want to now, I promise you to go back to personalized setting. In the personalized setting, uh, long story short, instead of a mu, which was just the reward, the reward depends on the covariates, like in the patient case, like a feature vector for that patient. And if you take that same scenario, we run a simulation and we see exactly the same behavior, although these greedy policies have larger confidence interval, but the phenomena is still correct, which is subsample greedy is the best policy. And one thing to highlight is, in fact, we did two versions. So D is the number of covariates, by the way. We did these two simulations for one reason, because there was prior literature that shows when there are features or covariates, greedy is helped. But that literature also shows that the number of covariates, the larger the number of covariates, greedy gets more help. So we are somehow putting these two on the side to so show that in this setting where the help because of features is much less, we are still seeing this subsample greedy being uh, superior. So that means this phenomena of many armed uh, help or many decisions helping greedy is going on regardless of whether you do personalization or not. So our mathematical model, which did not have personalization, does explain a phenomenon that seems to be based on the simulation hold even in the personalized regime. If I want to just conclude, uh, I just want to like, like takeaways for you with many decisions opportunity cost of learning optimal decision is very high. And subsampling is a critical step for any policy, like for practitioners specifically, like it's not a crazy idea to randomly take, select a set of decisions and go with them. And the greedy policies actually work very well in this setting. So these are like these, the main takeaways of uh, this talk. And in terms of future directions, we want to theoretically actually formalize this in the personalized regime as well, even though we think everything is valid based on the simulation. Uh, but mathematically, it's much harder to demonstrate it. And also more general reward functions in this setting, because I showed you a linear or generalized linear reward function. What about if I have like a nonlinear or more complex reward function? Can we still show the same phenomena holds? I'm going to stop for questions. Thank you all. All right, thank you very much. Um, some very exciting results from this research. So um, thank you again for sharing. We have a good amount of questions here and five or six minutes left. So I won't get to all of them, but we'll see how far we can get. Um, the first is from Alex and uh, wondering uh, if you can explain how to avoid local optima in, in the uh, selective algorithm. So if I want to somehow uh, local optimize pretty much, even though we are not doing a, like we are not, we don't have a continuous search space for our actions, our actions are discrete, but your point is valid that there are problems where our action set is continuous, like in pricing problems, if we're picking a price, that's a, or if you're selecting a dose for a, a trial, so then our actions become continuous. So this whole exploration is all about that, right? So the thing that we were mentioning in these slides that, you know, this can be the fact that greedy would be potentially a stock in that and not taking this action and being a stock is like a local optimized situation. And uh, so if you don't have the free exploration going on that the greedy benefits from in the money or many decision regime, you should explore, like you should have a mechanism that randomly actually explores. So you get out of that local optima. But uh, at the same time, uh, there may be a mechanism in your problem. Like, I don't know exactly what problem instance you're thinking about, but there may be a mechanism like what we explained here that allows you that even by being greedy, never get a stock to that local optima. 
Mm. And I, if I want to just put the analogy, it would be that if you are stuck in a local optima, that local optima is actually very close to a global optima. That's what our theory would tell you. But of course, I'm not, make, I'm not sure the setting you have in mind matches the settings that we can at least understand. Okay, no, that, that's good. And kind of a, a, a related question, and, and you might have, you kind of touched on it a bit, but um, there's a question from Daniel about whether you can deal with continuous space in this setting. Um, yes, so the continuous action set, so the personalized setting, uh, in fact, uh, the more general form of personalized setting is where actions form a polytope. And in fact, you can show at least for certain reward functions that only the corners of that polytope matter. And like say, for example, linear reward functions. And then that, that turns them to discrete. Like in fact, a pricing problem can be thought of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, like if you like just expand your feature set, like take the price and like various nonlinear uh, transformations of the price uh, and all of the, those will be your actions, then indeed you will have a discrete action problem. Those will be the corners of your polytope. Then because if you're assuming your reward would be a linear function of all those nonlinear transformation features. And then the theory, if there was one, sorry, for the context, contextual version or personalized version would apply. But uh, currently we can only say sim based on simulation that I believe to, it would be applicable. Okay, good, good, thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, another one about the subsampling. Um, how would you justify the subsampling? Um, should you really subset, um, select a subset of the decisions? Like what if there are actually only a few good decisions? Is, would that even happen? So this is a very good point. You know, in practice, it's very difficult. Like I have, I myself like work with practitioners. It's very difficult to justify to a manager that I'm going to just randomly select a subset of ag decisions and I'm going to ignore everything else. So what goes, goes on is you got to think about, can I look at certain criteria? Like for example, for those health messages, can I look at all the messages that have certain phrases in them? So I use those filters as a mechanism to subset my decisions. The only thing I want to keep in mind is through that subsetting, I will not bias, meaning I will not select potentially uh, worse decisions or like we want our subsetting will be still keeping a representative subset of the whole population. So use a business logic to pick a subset that is representative of the population. So that's the way to justify it. And even if you have a small number of actions that are very good, your subsetting, like the whole point of this subsampling, when you have too many of them is, you will still get at least one good decision in your final set. Remember, if the end goal is get at least one good decision, it doesn't matter if you drop some other good decisions. Okay, okay. so you, you're you kind of curating the subset, which I guess would make sense um, to make sure you have an appropriate representation. Yes. Good. Okay, um, so we have one minute left. We'll do one more question. Um, so this is around kind of that that threshold. Um, are Sergey is asking, are there safe recommendations on which T is good for a given K? So um, I'm assuming like is is there one where it's it's good enough? Maybe it doesn't meet the exact threshold, but you'd still recommend using the greedy algorithm. That's a very good question to to know. Like, even though theory says a square root T is the right place, uh, in practice you may. I'm not sure that, like, you could potentially uh, gain benefit even if your K is below a square root T by subsampling itself. But at least the simulations show us that, like, in fact, one thing that I didn't mention is this simulation. The greedy actually subsamples not a square root t. The subsample greedy it only subsamples. It sometimes subsamples even bigger. It subsamples like uh, t to the two third. Mm -hmm. So it is subsampling a bigger set, and still it performs well. So uh, basic, just because the greedy itself is still very good. Uh, so 
there is room, like we are, our theory do, do not give you like, a, because at the end, the theory is all about this rate optimality, does not tell you like the exact location of this threshold if you're looking at a finite T problem. But there is room, like short answer is there is room for you to like potentially try uh, like different numbers than that routine. And might it be, I guess, um industry specific or depending on what problem you're working on healthcare versus advertising it does depend because you know if you are in a in a setting where exploration is very expensive very difficult to get approval then you really want to err towards a greedy algorithm versus if your industry allows experimentation you want to err towards a, an algorithm that explores more and explore more just means uh, increase the threshold, uh, have so subsamples filter a larger set rather than a smaller set. So the industry, the fact that how the experimentation is uh, perceived, it can, it can impact this. Yeah, that's a very good point. Good. Okay. All right. So we are one minute over. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our audience for such great questions. We really appreciate everyone being here. Um, next week's uh, topic for the seminar is your mind on the metaverse. So uh, you can register through the HAI website and we hope to see you there. Thank you all. Thank you all.